Okay. Welcome once again to another presentation. Uh, this time we're starting with uh, course three. And uh, course three, you know, has to do with common co-occurring mental and medical disorders. I'm going to see another uh, professional. Uh, you know that uh, the brain has a very different and uh, we have a lot of mental illnesses which cause disturbance in the brain or originate as a result of disturbance in the brain. And then we find all kinds of symptoms. Now we have psychoactive substances to act in the brain. And because they act on the brain, they also cause symptoms. So we find that there are a lot of overlap of symptoms. Where there's a medical problem that affects the brain, and or it's mental illness, it's a substance use disorder. They all affect the brain and you find a lot of overlap of all these symptoms, but with some silent you know, differences. And that's why we find several disorders that occur together. Sometimes maybe just uh, mental illness and substance disorder, and other times maybe mental illness and medical disorders. But in some other cases, you may find the three uh, co-occurring you know, together mental illness, uh, medical illness, and also uh, substance use disorder. Let's move on. So what are the uh, learning objectives for this? It's a very interesting one, and I'm sure um, we'll all enjoy it and have a lot of experts you know, with us I have you know answer some of those questions because the question people have uh, that's the essence we all learn together uh Moduman, the learning objectives in this course three uh, as follows the, uh, course we'll be able to answer all these uh, questions so explain the overall goals and at least four objectives is meant to be and they will set at least one personal learning goal what you want to actually uh, learn in this uh, module or this course and then learn one interesting fact about at least four other participants is not a face-to-face -face, uh, interaction as such, but we are getting to know each other now because some people are very prominent in the fact that they participate very actively and answer questions. So we are getting to know each other even though it's not uh, a face-to-face -face interaction. Then list at least two reasons for SUD counselors to understand mental and medical disorders. Uh, they occur, occur, and sometimes people think it's just substance use disorder, and they think that they can treat it, and then that is all over, and then the, the client is doing well. No, some people might be taking uh, psychoactive substance because of medical conditions, and they want to actually, I mean, already symptoms of some medical conditions or even mental illness. But if you just see it as only substance use disorder, you might miss it. But it takes a lot of skill and the knowledge to be able to you know to tease out the differences what which one belongs to uh, medical illness and which one is uh, substance use disorder or which one is even uh, 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 combines all the three uh, disorders together so if you have enough knowledge then you'll be able to know whether the three are co-occurring or just two disorders are co-occurring but you have to look out for them otherwise you will not achieve the results you set out to achieve and then we'll be able to Briefly describe the concepts of substance use, substance use disorders, mental health, and mental disorders. These are terminologies that we use daily, but sometimes the concept may be very woolly for some people and very confusing for some, but we'll come to a consensus or we'll come to an agreement on what we are talking about so that when we say substance use disorders or mental health or mental disorders, we'll be speaking you know, the same language. 
uh, we, and we'll be you know, on the same page. So uh, these introductions, we're not going to do them because we had done them in course one. This is just a repetition in every course. This you know, uh, repeated. So we're well, just going straight to our slide because of uh, time constraint. So co-occurring with others, what do they actually mean? When a person has been diagnosed with both substance use disorder and at least one mental or medical disorder, then you say the person has uh, a co-occurring disorder. You no, know, remember, it's not just substance use disorder and mental uh, uh, health disorder, but it can also be a medical disorder. And as I told you, that anything that impacts the brain will elicit some symptoms. And because all these three uh, diseases or disorders can affect the brain, you can have an overlap of symptoms from the various diseases. And a medical illness can present with the symptoms of you know, somebody who uses uh, psychoactive uh, substances. And the psycho psychoactive substance can produce symptoms that mimic a medical illness or a mental disorder because they all affect the brain. And as I told you, the brain has a narrow range in which it can actually express itself in terms of symptoms. Then, as a result, you find a lot of overlap in whatever disturbs brain functions. What is the prevalence? According to WHO you know, report in 2010, more than 450 million people in the world suffer from diagnosable mental disorders. This we, you know, we got to know uh, in uh, course one, and even more have less extreme mental disorders. Because when people talk about mental illnesses or mental disorders, people tend to think of maybe severe depression or the psychotic disorders, or sometimes, uh, for instance, uh, people who have a bipolar uh, disorders, and so on and so forth. But the ones like the mild anxiety disorders, the various phobias, panic disorders, people may not even see them as mental illnesses so, so the mind doesn't really go there and most times such ones do not uh, uh, go into admission you know because of their problems they can be treated as art patients with uh, either counseling or counseling and uh, pharmacotherapy but for the major ones most times you have to use uh, pharmacotherapy and also uh, psychosocial intervention and over 29 million people between the ages of 15 and 64 use illicit substances at a level defined as problem use. We had discussed this you know, in course one. This was also uh, by uh, the UNDC World Drug Report 2016. What is the privilege? You can see these two big circles and then they intersect. Here we find mental disorder where my cursor is pointing. Mental disorders, we find them you know, taking the large circle. But if somebody is using substances or other, oh, sorry. Define uh, the smaller circle is for those who use substances who, who have substances disorder. But you can see in this intersection, in this, uh, where the arrow is pointed to, is where you find co occurring substance other and mental disorder. And instead of about 45% of those with mental of those substances. But you know, ours is a clinical sample, it's not a population study, it's a clinical sample. And most of the ones with a less uh, uh, lesser problem would be filtered, you know, out by the system, and only severe cases go to us. So at least sixty percent of the, those who, uh, substances also come down with co-occurring mental disorder, which means that when you have a client who is so you must have a high index of suspicion. Just go focusing on the mental illness alone, or mental disorder, in, I mean, substance disorder, and neglecting the 
uh, mental disorder. Most times my uh, my clients will come and say, I only have a drug issue, or even their sponsor say, and I want to refer to nothing more. I said, well, no problem. How long do you think it's going to stay in this hotel that will give you any uh, good answer on the phone until I see him? So, okay, we'll come over. And truly, I start to find that there's others. So, co-occurring these others, what are the challenges? They actually come with a lot of challenges. Uh, there are negative uh, effects on treatment outcomes for both sub substance use and mental disorders. So if you have a co-occurrence order and you don't set out to tackle both at the same time, then you are, you are sure that you're not going to get in a good outcome. Clients with co-occurrence substance use disorders and mental disorders tend to have fewer and less adequate relationships. No doubt. They have fewer and less adequate uh relationships and also weaker social support network employment all this for people who come on mental illness all this it makes it more complicated and that's why when we are assessing class class we have to look at them for this time you know in the costume we talk about wellness there are dimensions you know, so if we don't look at uh, the client in all these dimensions then we'll not be doing justice to what we're trying to you know to do it's one factors you know uh, to health worldwide and this is uh, also by a report in 2010 so you find that uh, substances or that's all illicit drug use so make people more vulnerable to developing all kinds of illnesses, not just mental illnesses, but also medical illnesses. I will know that many of them, in my own uh, 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 practice, you find a lot of them coming either with uh, respiratory problems, some of them come with metabolic problems, for instance, diabetes, and then those who are alcoholics, in fact, come down with um, uh, uh, liver problems, uh, liver disease, and some of them is to test them for all these and clear. And some of them never knew that they were either HIV positive, some of them never knew that they were hepatitis B positive, or even HIV, so on and so forth. So, uh, sometimes other is also a risk factor, especially, you know, substance. Because when they use illicit substance, for instance, in my own place, they tend to people because another the society proud me so they, they will suffer you know they are not quick to come out you know and, and seek uh, help multiple co-occurrence order can occur and we say this you know as I said earlier sometimes you have somebody uh, with a substance and comes down with substance disorder also comes down with a mental uh, health disorder and then medical uh, I, I see many of them, the alcoholics, they come down with depression and they also come down uh, uh, with, with uh, diabetes. So you have to manage all the three. And you know, most diabetes too uh, are vulnerable to developing a, a depression. So it tends to cause it with diabetes too. So if you don't look at it, you will never achieve a good or get a good outcome in the end until you look at the person or the client holistically, you will miss it. And that's why uh, treating clients, especially in my own uh, uh, place, uh, is, is not an easy thing. And that's why we make it a treatment center where we have a lot of uh, professionals involved. Otherwise, we will not be doing well. We'll go further to the course learning objectives. We have to explain key terminology and Excuse me, Moses. Um, we're having some yes. issues with garbled audio on everyone's part. So Beatrice suggested that um, if your phone is on to turn it off to maybe give your um, 
network connection more strength for the presentation? Oh, you're not hearing me? Every once in a while, your audio cuts out. Oh, sorry about that. But can you hear me now? Um, Hello? Yes, I can hear you now. Oh, I didn't know that. Okay. Okay, um, I'll let you it's, know if it's, it's raining right. heavily. It's raining heavily, it's, okay. It's that, that's likely the problem. Really, yeah, so, yeah, that's likely the problem. When it rains, it interferes with network all over. Yeah, so I'm sorry about that. So, okay, it's uh, not your fault. Further, uh, okay. <laughs> further course learning objectives. Explaining key terminology and concepts. And then we describe the biological and environmental risk and protective factors involved with co-occurring disorders. Discuss six major mental disorders and SUD counseling suggestions for each. Induced mental disorders. Sometimes the mental disorders can be induced by dependent or addicted. Some of them tend to come down with uh, mental illnesses that are induced by the substance use. And then describe three major medical disorders that impact SUDs and integrate this concept into your role as an SUD counselor. So very interesting and in our objectives. Let's move on. So we are going to do a two minute exercise now. Please, you write two training expectations on your, uh, on your journal. Chat and then uh, uh, the administrator will be able to read uh, some of them so that we get to know whether we can meet them in this uh, module. What course? Course three. So I give you just two minutes to write them. You can write them on the chat, then she will read them, up, you know, and then we we'll see whether we can answer them. I hope the instruction is clear enough. Um. It's better at the moment. Every once in a while it gets a bit garbled, but if it's the weather, I'm not sure that anything can really be done about it. But are the instructions clear? Um, at the moment we can two hear you, I believe. Okay, two training expectations. We see we have one and a half hours, I mean minutes, sorry, to write them. I don't have two minutes for you, so we have uh, a minute and 30 seconds to write our training expectations for this course three. A minute more, please. Thirty seconds more. Did we lose Moses? I 
want to end this last show because I wasn't getting anything from you. Can you hear me now? Oh, um, yes, I can hear you now. Um, I Sorry, I couldn't hear you before. So we have a um, few answers here. We have um, learn how to treat parallel both substance use and psychiatric disorders, um, interactions between AUD and other disorders. Okay, great. And um, treatment and management of SUD and co-occurring disorders. Okay. To achieve high rates of success in treatment of patients with comorbidity. Okay. And we also have how to prioritize treatment in the case of complex comorbidity of SUD, medical con condition, and mental illness. Okay. Some of it will be good achieve it later. Okay. Okay. okay, let's go back to our last show. Okay, so let's proceed. We are going to have some group exercises. I hope you, are, you, you can hear me now. Um, yes, I can hear you now. Okay, we are going to proceed with some uh, small group exercises. Uh, we are going to define what mental health is and uh, mental disorder and substance use disorder. I think we have like uh, five minutes for this. And now what I want to do is that for all the regions, uh, North Africa, East Africa, Southern Africa, and West Africa, all of you will define, you know, take five minutes to define what mental health is what mental disorder is all about, and then what substance use disorder is all about. So I give you five minutes to, to define this. Then I will call you, you share your own uh, definitions with me. So all the regions, North, East, Southern Africa, West Africa, please try and answer these questions. Write down what you understand by mental health, mental disorder and substance use disorder. I give you five minutes to define this in your own uh, opinion or based on your own understanding and your practice. Please define this terminology for us before we proceed. You have four minutes more, but I will be calling you later to share. One each from uh, each region we will share because uh, of time constraints. We're not going to continue, you know, uh, allowing everybody to share. But please, it's a very good exercise. We want to know what we understand by mental health, mental disorder, substance use disorder. Uh, for uh, three minutes more. Hi, um, Moses, um, can we actually yes. assign this as homework because um, due to some of the connectivity okay. issues, we've um, passed our allotted time and we have to leave um, okay. Okay. time okay. for Kim to okay. explain the learning system at the end. Okay, but actually those exercises are key and those have helped us. So let's define mental health. Uh, mental health, uh, mental health is you know, uh, defined as uh, a state, that's by the WHO, is a state of well-being in which every individual realizes his or her own potential, can cope with the normal stresses of life, can work productively and fruitfully, and is able to make a contribution to her or his community. So you see, we are talking about an uh, uh, individual realizing his or her potential, and then cope with normal stresses of life, and working productively and fruitfully, and being able to make contribution to her or his community. Usually when I'm taking this, I ask my, my students or my participants to, to determine whether they think they're health, mentally healthy or not. 
but some other will also as add as spiritual health. And some other definition of a, a mental health is a psychological state of balance in which a person is in control of his or her thinking, impulses, and behavior while meeting the ordinary demands of everyday life. I repeat again, a psychological state of balance in which a person is in control of his or her thinking, impulses, and behavior while meeting the ordinary demands of everyday life. That's another definition. But as I said, some people will also ask spiritual health. But then, if we talk about mental health, let's talk about uh, mental disorder. What is mental disorder? Because most times, people talk about mental disorders, we will have, you know, our idea of uh, mental disorder is very woolly. People think of it in different ways. So, this is a DSM-5 uh, 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 definition. Oh. It says a syndrome characterized by clinically significant disturbance in an individual's cognition, emotion, emotional regulation or behavior that reflects a dysfunction in the psychological, biological, or developmental processes underlying mental functioning. Mental health disorders are usually associated with significant distress or disability in social, occupational, or other important activities. So you see, it's a very comprehensive uh, uh, definition is is talking about uh, there should be every evidence of impairment or loss of control, and it's also talking about uh, impairment in social and uh, occupational or other important activities. It's also talking about you know uh, risky use and pharmacological uh, criteria in all these uh, definitions. So. This is a definition of mental Moving with the camera. So this is a definition of a mental disorder. And I said this is by the GSM-5 definition. So let's proceed. Mental disorder, the lack, it then means that uh, the definition, according to this definition, uh, is not just the absence of an illness, but an expectable response or an expectable response to common stressors and losses. For example, the loss of a loved one or a culturally sanctioned response to a particular event, for example, trans states in some cultures or religious rituals, and primarily a consequence of social deviance or uh, conflict with society. So what he's saying is that uh, most community will define mental illness in you not know, differently. So what consists of mental illness in my culture, might not be mental illness in some other culture. Because I know in northern Nigeria, there are such a religious ritual where people go into you know, trans states and do all kinds of things that in the Western world we think is mental illness. But to us, it's not mental illness. Similarly, I knew when we were growing up, when some, when some people come, uh, no, uh, most of Nigerians go to study abroad, when they come from the US, for instance, and start behaving like Americans, people say, ah, is this one actually normal? Because they don't conform to our culture. And the way they talk, they don't respect, tend to have respect for people or conform to the norms. And then as far as concerned, this one is already done, they say this one is already crazy. So mental illness is actually defined by the community. So what consists mental illness in one community don't necessarily constitute mental illness in another community. So let's get that very clearly. And then uh, substance use disorders. We are attempted you know, to uh, define substance use disorders in uh, uh, course one. So, what is substance use disorder? Substance use disorder occurs when the recurrent use of alcohol and or drugs causes clinically and functionally significant impairments such as health problems, disability, and failure to meet major responsibilities at work, school, or home. So, this is mental disorder. But you know, we talk about substance abuse which is not as severe as uh, those who are addicted because for substance abuse, yes, there are some impairments, but you try to treat people who abuse substance so that they don't you know, graduate into addiction because addiction is a chronic uh, relapsing brain disease. So you don't want people to get to addiction because it's going to be you know, a lifelong uh, problem. So, and, these are the definitions that we need to be conversant with as you know we continue in uh, this uh, course.
the different modules we make references you know to them as we move along so at this uh, juncture i think uh, uh beatrice will take over thank you thank you moses i think today is one of those days when we in africa are having lots of challenges with connectivity into zoom i i hope that you can hear me yeah yes we very can very hear clearly you. thank you so i i know in 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 my part of the country we've been struggling with zoom the entire day so i guess there could also be a network problem with uh, zoom across many of our areas but we hope that we can communicate and you can get to understand what we are saying and at least you can see the slides so where you can't get what we are speaking you can pick from the slides um i'm going to start looking at module two thank you moses for having taken us through the introduction to this course i always like to remind us that this is a multidisciplinary course some of the courses will sound more familiar to some people others to other people i am certain that anybody practicing psychiatry is going to be feeling like this is a walkthrough or a walk over because this is what they do every day and i also know that for moses if i gave him a chance he would use the entire time telling us about these disorders because this is what he does every day for a living so for those of you who are psychiatrists be patient with us so that those of us who are not psychiatrists have a chance to just understand the basics and like i said across the the utcs every time we meet a certain curricula it is more friendly to certain disciplines than others because of the multidisciplinary nature of the field of sud treatment and i think the reason why we haven't succeeded over the years in treating clients with sud is because we gave it a fragmented approach where the psychiatrist was doing his thing the counselor had her thing, the social worker her thing or his thing. And so now what we are doing or what UTCs have done is to integrate this all whole disciplines into one integrated approach to addressing um, uh, uh, substance use disorders and possibly evolving a whole new field of substance use disorders treatment. So in module two now, we're going to look at the history of vulnerabilities to co-occurring disorders we're going to be looking at the impact of co-occurring disorders. I will do the first part of this module and Moses will come back to do the last part that uh, Dr. Moreque was to cover. And I send you all greetings and love from Moreque. She thanks you for your kind wishes for recovery. She's still in hospital, but she's doing much better. So we hope she can rejoin us soon. So in this uh, part that I'm going to cover, I'm going to look at the history or the evolution of the field of co-occurring disorders or what I'm going to be calling CODs. We are going to look a little about the common terminology that is used in the field of CODs. And I will say something about causation. And I have actually seen one of the expectations of one of the participants when you wrote, you wrote your expectations was that someone wants to understand what causes the other. Is it the SUD causing the uh, SUD or is it the SUD causing the COD? So I'm sure we're going to cover that in the final portion. And then uh, uh, Moses will come in to help us look at how, uh, you know, adolescents uh, are affected by mental health and how that contributes to SUD amongst other things. And then of course in uh, uh, module three, we shall start looking at the actual disorders. So here we go. So this module is about identifying key developments and efforts in the history of treating CODs. Secondly, we want to be able to describe why SUDs often co-occur with other mental illnesses. And thirdly, we're going to discuss the factors that affect client vulnerabilities to comorbidity or the co-occurrence of SUD and other mental health disorders. So now coming to the history of terminology that we use in COD, uh, we want to note that COD terminology is generally new to both mental health therapists as well as SUD counselors. The reason being, each of these people was working in their field and with their clients. So the SUD counselors worked with clients for years, focusing on substance use and how to help clients come out of substance use. 
mental health uh, practitioners for years focused on trying to help their clients address mental health disorders. But none of them for years thought that there was a marriage between their two fields. And that's why we are saying the terminology is new to both fields. And we are going to see how it has evolved to now the field we are calling of CODs or looking at the client issues from a common point of, um, of a, a vision. You can see this picture here has two arrows. So this is our client. On the left is the, men, the mental health therapist or physician or, or psychiatrist or doctor. On the right side is the SUD counselor. You're all treating the same client from your directions, but then over time it was discovered that we, need, we saw, and Moses has told us about the intersection between mental health disorders and SUD. So because of that, then more and more uh, literature has shown that we need to integrate our approach to working with these clients. So what are some of the terms that have been used over the last 40 years to describe people with CODs? These are all of them. So some of them include MICA, which is the mentally ill chemical abuser. So the mentally ill chemical abuser is, came from the field of those who are treating SUD, and they just said, you know what, this chemical abuser is mentally ill. Then we have the other one that says the chemically addicted and mentally ill. So this one recognizes that the client has both the addiction and the mental illness. Over time, another term evolved, which was called the dually disordered or dual diagnosis. So dually disordered with the use of the word disorder. And I hope you notice that up to there, there is quite a bit of labeling. I say this because in curriculum one, we were taught about the use of labels and how we should have the person first before the label. So you can see the first three were focusing on the label, the illness rather than the person. In the fourth one, there was use of comorbid disorders. Comorbid means coexisting. And of course, the final one there is the dual diagnosis, which is really talking about two diagnoses. But again, we have heard from Moses one can actually have more than two disorders. So if there are more than two, do this, do this two become dual? So the word core occurring becomes a better terminology. So comorbidity then is the term used in the medical and psychological communities to describe the existence of two or more illnesses in the same individual. So you notice this term accommodates more than two. So if a client has a, a mental illness like depression, uh, they have also substance use disorder, they also have HIV AIDS, we cannot say they have comorbidity because they have the existence of two or more uh, illnesses. So they have a mental illness, they have an SUD, they have a physical uh, or medical condition. And these ones occur in the same individual simultaneously or sequentially. Sequentially just means one after the other. Now we're also saying that sometimes this term is used to describe when a mental disorder occurs alongside an SUD. And I think that Moses has explained. And we are also saying other terms that are still in use today include the co-occurring disorder, the dual diagnosis, or comorbidity. So you will discover and you might want to think of what you use back home. Now, what is a co-occurring disorder? I know Moses has mentioned this, but this slide articulates that. That is, it is when at least one disorder of each type can be established independently of the other. I think that's an important point. And at the same time, it is not simply a cluster of symptoms resulting from a single disorder. So if your client uses substances and has an SUD, and maybe one of the substances they use is a, a substance that may produce psychosis, and the client presents with psychotic symptoms, shall we say they have a dual diagnosis or a co-occurring disorder? Maybe not, because it's likely that the psychotic features might just be a cluster of symptoms resulting from the substance they are abusing. So, and I have seen this a lot with clients who abuse marijuana, they present with psychotic features and they are hearing voices and they're having delusions and it is difficult for the psychiatrist to tell, is this a true diagnosis of schizophrenia or is this actually a cluster of symptoms resulting from the abuse of cannabis. So this is what we are saying, that for us to say someone has co-occurring disorder, we must be able to establish the two disorders independent of each other. And so even when the person stops using the substance, these symptoms do not necessarily subside. So that is what this slide is about. So a COD diagnosis can be made when at least one mental or medical disorder 
can be established in addition to or independent of an SUD. And that's where the catch is. Sometimes you're not sure whether the manifestation you're seeing is an independent men mental disorder or it is actually as a result of the SUD and may probably win over time. A counselor or the therapist or the practitioner must discern that the cluster of symptoms does not result from just one type of disorder. And at the same time, that the mental disorder symptoms don't clear when the substance use stops. So I think that's just an emphasis that for us to say, this person has a co-occurring disorder, we must have established that each of these disorders is independent of each other, and one is not just manifesting symptoms caused by the other. So that is what that is about. Historically, we are saying that in the 70s, mental health therapists and SUD counselors recognized the combination of having both an SUD and a mental illness was causing serious impacts. So early interventions mainly focused on depression and SUD because uh, depression is very common among in many, many persons with SUDs. But in the 80s and 90s, many mental disorders became associated with SUDs and depression and anxiety seemed to be the most common of this. Now this uh, slide shows us the kind of interaction between SUD and mental disorders. And of course, you can see right here in the middle, we have got the intersection where we have got the core occurrence. So on the right, we have the mental disorders on their own. On the left, we have the SUDs on their own, but somewhere in the middle is the intersection of clients who will actually suffer from co-occurring disorders. Uh, like Moses had said earlier, evidence suggests that 48, 42.8% of adults who present with an SUD also seem to have a mental disorder, which now tells you why people in the field of SUD cannot run away from having to look at mental disorders. But yet in many of our treatment centers, the kind of training our service providers have been given does not even cover anything to do with mental disorders. It's much more the SUD treatment. And therefore, this 42% of people being treated for SUD only are likely to relapse because the mental disorder might be a trigger or might worsen the, the SUD problem like Moses had said earlier. At the same time, there is evidence to suggest that 17.6% of adults who present with a mental disorder are also likely to have an SUD. So again, those who are working in mental health facilities and working on focusing on mental disorders need to be aware that a percentage of those patients might actually have an SUD. And like we're going to be seeing when clients or patients have an SUD in addition to a mental disorder, it complicates lots of things. It complicates adherence to treatment. It, it complicates the prognosis. It, it, it uh, complicates the outcomes. So we need to be aware of co-occurring disorders. And that's why this course is very important, uh, particularly for all of us, whether we are coming from the field of treating mental disorders or from the field of treating substance use disorders. Now, again, we have some statistics and some evidence around gender and CODs, which are presented in this slide. And one of them is that the overall rates of abuse and dependence for most drugs, like we know, tend to be higher among males than females. At the same time, males are more likely to suffer from antisocial personality disorder, but women or females will present with higher rates than men of diagnosed mood and anxiety disorders. And you notice that third point is talking about diagnosed because it's also possible that the males have it, but they may not necessarily present themselves for the diagnosis to be obtained. Now, again, in terms of history of CODs, we want to note that by 2000, the year 2000, both mental health and substance use disorders organizations in the US were issuing criteria for COD diagnosis. So they had come to realize that we cannot work with these two conditions in isolation. They had come to respect the intersection. And so they began issuing criteria for COD diagnosis. They began initiating what is called cross-training between the two fields, where uh, people in um, treatment of mental disorders would be given skilling in, in the identification of SUDs and intervention. People in SUD intervention would be given skilling in mental health disorders, identification, and possible referral. And then they began coordinating research efforts. 
Now, again, the same year, WHO recognized the need to merge two important departments. So previously, the Department of Mental Health was separate from that of substance abuse, but when they discovered the commonality, the intersection, and there was need to adopt common approaches, then they merged the two departments into one department, which is the Department of Mental Health and Substance Abuse. And uh, you might want to ask yourself about your country. How are we treating uh, uh, clients with substance use disorders and mental illnesses? Are we still isolating them or are we merging the departments to look at them in an integrated way? I know I was in a meeting someday with um, officers from the Ministry of Health in my country, uh, the Department of Mental Health, and they were meeting the National Authority for, for Drug Control in Kenya. And one of the suggestions I made is that it is time they stopped working in isolation as Department of Mental Health and the Substance Abuse Control, and they merged their efforts so that we get an integrated approach. And that's part of the advocacy we can do back home in our countries. Now, WHO had concerns about CODs, and that's why they decided to make that merge. They noticed that C uh, substance use disorders had significant impact on mental disorders. And so in this specific quotation from WHO, it says that substance use disorders are also significant comorbid conditions that can alter the course of illness, treatment, and outcome. Comorbid substance use disorders or substance abuse can add dramatically to the degree of morbidity and functional incapacity of the individual and may influence the type of care provided. This is a loaded quotation that acknowledges that if your clients with mental health also have substance use disorders, it will actually alter the course of illness, the course of treatment, and even the outcome. And some of the areas you can think about is things like how, I have seen this in our mental hospitals, Clients are they are being treated for a mental illness, then they start abusing a medical drug right there in the hospital and they complicate with a lot of symptoms and they are never getting better. I have been in a place where I saw clients being treated for, for mental health issues and then they started sneaking in a, a cigarettes into the treatment center and they complicate the outcome of the treatment. And the reason why we need to understand this, if we remember curriculum one, we did say that drugs are in different categories. Some are stimulants, some are, uh, um, are depressants, some are hallucinogens, which then means if a client is being treated with an antidepressant and then they are abusing alcohol, you can see what is happening. So these are all things that these concerns of WHO are addressing. I do not want to focus too much on DSM-5 definition of mental disorder. I think Moses has talked about that, that it's where there is clinically significant disturbance in several areas, cognition, emotion, regulation, and behavior. And of course, the outcome of that is impairment in functioning or distress. And it can impair one or more areas, whether it is academic, if it's a student, occupational for someone working, family or social, all these are areas that can become impaired. So that's what all this is about. And so that I don't need to say too much about. Now, I want to focus on this slide no labeling, that when we talk about persons with co-occurring disorders, we are challenged to avoid the use of labels. We need to identify the individual first before the, the, the disorder or before the sickness. So rather than say a schizophrenic, we should be saying a person with this condition called schizophrenia. Rather than saying a heroin addict, we should be saying a person that is abusing heroin or addicted to heroin. So what we are being told to do in this slide is to, 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 to fight stigma. A bit of it has to do with the language we use. So don't say that drunkard or that addict or that schizophrenic. Instead, talk about the person with depression or the person with schizophrenia. That's what this slide is challenging at. Our final section is talking about causation. And this is why I was saying that the person who asked the question about what comes first, it is really a chicken and an egg story. We don't know whether the chicken came before the hen or before the egg or the egg came before the chicken. So we are noting that there is a high prevalence of co-occurrence between SUD and mental disorders. However, that does not necessarily mean that one has caused the other. And the reason is because 
Understanding the causality or directionality can be difficult because of multiple reasons, and we are going to talk about four of them in the next slides. The first scenario of causality is where drug abuse may cause psychiatric symptoms, or drug abuse may cause cognitive impairment, or drug abuse may facilitate the full expression of what was previously a latent disorder. Now, latent means it had not expressed itself, it had potential, maybe the client had a biological uh, 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 predisposition or um, a biological vulnerability to develop that mental illness, but it hadn't developed. And maybe it was never going to develop. But when they start using substances, this latent disorder actually becomes fully manifest. And I think I have seen cases of clients who use, who start using cannabis uh, heavy, heavy doses, eventually end up with a full blown diagnosis of schizophrenia. Uh, initially, they, uh, they present like symptoms of, um, you know, uh, psychosis, which might just be drug induced. But over time, even when they stop using the drug, the disease uh, symptoms continue and eventually they are diagnosed. And you look at their family history, you discover that there is a history of that disease in the family. So eventually, you notice that the substance abuse or the drug use facilitated the expression of a disorder that may not necessarily have come out. So in a way, we would say perhaps that that uh, mental illness could be caused by the drug abuse, but we also can say that with certainty. And these are examples actually about marijuana, also about ecstasy and mood disorders. The second scenario is where a mental disorder may lead to SUD. For example, people have been treated for mental disorders with certain medication, or people have started using certain medicines to care for, to self-medicate for symptoms of mental disorder. They didn't know there were symptoms of mental disorder. So for example, they have anxiety and they decide they want to calm their nerves. They start using a substance. Eventually that substance becomes a substance of abuse. Eventually they become dependent on it. So you end up finding that what led to substance abuse for this patient is actually an underlying mental disorder that may never have been discovered. I, I have come across clients, particularly women, who become addicted to depressants, which they started using sometimes to look for sleep, sometimes to calm anxiety and nervousness. They never did it because they wanted to be addicted. They were self-medicating. But in the process, they actually got addicted to the medical drug and they ended up with an SUD. When the family history is checked, they realize this patient comes from a family history with a lot of mental disorders. So it's likely the patient started with a mental disorder that was manifesting but not diagnosed. And as they tried to self-medicate to deal with the symptoms, they ended up with an SUD. That is the second uh, scenario of causality. Now in the third scenario is where neither of the two causes the other, but both of them are caused by underlying factors. A good example is problems with the brain. So for example, the brain may have def deficits or injuries, whether it is because of the structure or the biological chemicals in the brain. And this might trigger both an SUD as well as a mental disorder. I know sometimes we've talked about dopamine in curriculum one. Sometimes if the level of neurotransmitters being produced by someone's brain are low, you could as well end up with, a, a ment uh, we could end up with depression, for example, but you could also end up with a trigger that pushes you towards using substances. And therefore, both the mental disorder and the SUD are being caused by a third factor. The third factor could also be genetic vulnerability or uh, exposure to drugs prenatally. So in short, in this third scenario, neither the SUD causes the mental disorder nor the mental disorder causes the SUD, but both are caused by a third underlying factor. And in the final scenario, which we are calling scenario four, this is where the two disorders just seem to start at the same time. We cannot say whether they were caused by a common factor or whether one caused the other, but they just appear uh, simultaneously at the same time. This is common in late adolescence and early adulthood typically, which is why for those of us now working in universities, this course is important because a lot of the students we teach are in late adolescence and early adulthood the stage when both mental disorders and SUDs could typically start appearing, which then begins, which then means we could have a lot of our students struggling with 
co-occurring disorders. I know what manifests the most is actually the SUD. Like in my country, in my country and in my university, we are struggling a lot with alcohol use disorders and also cannabis use. It might just be that these are students who are at the age where, and many of them become psychotic and others end up with depression. And so this could just be because they are at the age when both these disorders are showing up. And we also know that at this age, it's when many people begin using or increasing their substance use. So that could just explain how uh, the, two conditions, the two conditions are happening. So in short and in summary, we are saying it's difficult to really say whether A caused B or whether SUD causes mental disorder or whether mental disorder caused SUD because of all these uh, possible scenarios. But the key thing that we need to understand is that whichever or irrespective of what caused the other, it is important in our interventions that we manage the two conditions together. And in future slides in this uh, module, I mean, in this um, curriculum, we are going to see the suggested ways, evidence-based, that we can use to enhance the way we manage co-occurring disorders, which is part of what I have seen in some of our expectations. I wish to stop there and hand it over to Moses. Uh, so Moses, please take it up. Thank you. And please remember to leave 10 minutes for Kim at the end. Thank you. Thank you, Beatrice, for that uh, elaborate uh, presentation. You've laid a good foundation for me to continue. Uh, now we'll continue with uh, adolescent brain impact. Adolescent brain impact. There are significant brain changes in adolescence, and uh, this adds to ACD and mental disorder vulnerability. You discover that uh, several cases of SUDs or even mental illness, you know, begin in adolescence, and it's because of these brain changes that are taking place. They are growing physically, they are growing psychologically, they are learning new skills, and then the brain is also you know, uh, developing and neurons have been laid, connections have been laid, so on and so forth. So these brain changes, you know, predispose these adolescents not only to SUDs, but uh, uh, mental disorder, you know, also. So SUDs impact brain cycles involving learning and memory. For every uh, activity, there are brain cycles that subserve you no know, such, you know, uh, activities. So when you talk about learning and memory, there are brain cycles that are also functions. We talked about the, the, the reward, you know, a, a cycle uh, uh, earlier on. And then we also, sorry, we also talked about, you know, decision making, you know. There are brain cycles that also uh, solve decision making in an individual, you have to weigh the pros and the cons, you know, before you finally make up your mind. And you need uh, your, your a sound judgment to be able to make decisions in, in, in the right direction. And they also talk about emotional development and behavioral control. So all these cycles or all these activities or all these phenomena are subserved by brain cycles. So if the brain is not properly developed, or the development of the brain is interfered with, is interrupted during adolescence, then you begin to find problems with learning memory, reward, and decision making, uh, emotional development, and behavioral control. And we said, you know, also that, uh, you know that uh, the judgment and the prefrontal cortex develops much later. And that is supposed to be able to exert control, you know, uh, over the primitive mind or the emotional mind. But most of them are just emotions. That one is more developed. And then the, 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 the control from the prefrontal cortex, you know, to subserve, you know, to be able to exert this control over their emotions is not yet very much developed. 
but they're already ex exercising the limit system so much. So even when uh, they want to actually make up their mind, the, 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 the limbic system or the emotional mind, you know, kicks against the control from the uh, prefrontal cortex, which is not even uh, much developed or mature enough to actually exert and, and control whatever you know, uh, they are actually enjoying at that moment. So these are the problems that we find with uh, the adolescent uh, brain. So a uh, long-term impact of early drug use or uh, early drug exposure, what happens? Comorbidity, comorbidity research shows clearly that early substance use is a risk factor for later substance use disorders. Because most of the brain uh, uh, centers or cycles that observe uh, substances also uh, uh, you know, cause a mental illness if there's any interference with their own function. And then early substance use may also be a risk factor for later occurrence of other mental disorders. The same cycle, same neurotransmitter that are being you know, used. And when they start using substances at very early age or during adolescence, when the brain is not fully developed, then a lot of it, the, the developmental process is interrupted and the, the willpower is not really very much developed because the prefrontal cortex develops much later. And you know, we talked about development you know, starting from uh, posteriorly and then going frontally. If you, if you recall what we studied in uh, Module 1. So the, the prefrontal cortex develops much later. So the functions are not very much uh, uh, exercised because it is not as developed as the others. And long term impact of early drug exposure you know, is linked to genetic vulnerability. Studies are, are showing, have shown that uh, people who uh, uh, use substances might have a lot of uh, genetic uh, uh, factors you know, uh, involved in this risky uh, behavior. And uh, it is uh, said that uh, fat genetics plays about, uh, or account for about 50% of uh, vulnerability to substance use. So genetic factors, are responsible for some people even starting substance use in adolescence. Some will develop or will start substance use in adulthood. Some, in fact, even in uh, in in old age or middle uh, uh, middle age. But some as early as uh, even 12 years, 10 years, some have already started substance use. So genetics account for uh, this uh, variation. And then psychosocial experiences, psychosocial experiences, the kind of environment they grew up, maybe the family environment maybe the school environment, some, some home is hell, and they don't want to leave there. So we just do all kinds of abuses, and they're traumatized. And for some, even uh, general environmental influences, the environment, the environment which they live, they live in, the community, there is acceptance, you know, to uh, uh, cultural acceptance, you know, to uh, all, uh, to drug use, and a lot of people don't see anything wrong with using substances. For instance, if you come to my own environment, uh, alcohol is a cultural artifact, so you can use it as early as possible. Some people, even at five years of age, have started using alcohol, so it's a norm. So, what is the big deal there? When they talk to them, they say, This is our own culture, we are used to taking it. So, what is the problem? So, now when you have genetic, genetic factors interacting with social or psychosocial uh, factors, and also the environmental factors, then you find a more complex interaction, which can lead to uh, uh, substances or early substances. So it's not as simplistic as people, you know, think. And we talked about even epigenetic factors, if you recall, in uh, uh, module one. So long-term impact of early mental disorder. Conduct disorders and untreated attention deficit hyperactivity disorder may increase risk of later substance use. And that's very true because if they are not treated because of their own condition, they become restless. And they don't pay, so children with ADHD they may not be able to pay attention. So they don't learn these skills like some other, uh, uh, some other uh, young people do not learn. Because they cannot pay attention, so they don't negotiate the various phases of development, and you know, like the other people, so they are prone to all kinds of risky behavior. Not because of their own making, 
And sometimes they say they are very stubborn, they are very restless. But it's because uh, some of them suffer from uh, ADHD, which is in an environment like mine, many people don't even understand what ADHD is. It's only the medical personnel, you know, or the clinical staff that tend to understand what ADHD, you know, is all about. So there's a lot of awareness now and advocacy, that, and then even to schools, that there are some children who are restless about it. It's not because they're stubborn. Don't beat them, you know. They need, you know, medical attention. And today, before I, I came, you know, for this presentation, I had a client that was referred to me. The mother said he has been hyperactive right from childhood. And he's been to two, three, this, the university he's attending is the third one. He keeps dropping out of every university. I'm very restless, very stubborn. And then he's using substances. He started, even when he was 14 years old, he has started using marijuana. And he doesn't know why. And she said, my husband is a, is a, is a priest. How can my son be doing this kind of thing? So I had to sit down and you know, explain to her. So these are the things that we're talking about. So genetics play you know, a major role in this. Co-occurring disorders in adolescents, regardless of how you know, they develop, STD treatment programs for adolescents should include screening for mental disorders and treatment for mental disorders as needed. As I said earlier, these things coexist. And if you're only looking at the substance use, then you're not looking at the total picture. You have to screen. You have to have high index of suspicion. Why is this client using substances at this early age? There might be other psychosocial problems. There might be genetic factors. It may even run in families. So you have to be, you know, you, you, you have to do very thorough assessment. Otherwise, you miss it and do not achieve any uh, good result and you get even frustrated. So, but when you have uh, good treatment centers where you have a lot of the, or most of the professionals involved, then you can tackle you know, almost every problem you know, that come. And they refer for some um, other services that you're not able to provide in your own uh, facility. So adolescents, you know, a society is actually a very challenging thing that uh, we need to actually uh, look at and make sure that you know, they have, uh, or they are referred to places where they are integrated you know, uh, service or delivery, just like, uh, uh, which is explained earlier. And current uh, co-occurrence co other research is showing that uh, genes that predispose to individuals to develop both addiction or other mental disorders have a greater risk for a second disorder after the first disease. You know, it is uh, said that uh, uh, the, the genes actually that are responsible for, for instance, for uh, cannabis use are also uh, responsible for development of psychosis. So you find the same genes, you know, uh, predisposes uh, a client to using cannabis and also making him come down with uh, psychosis. And Beatrice gave an instance of one who was using uh, cannabis for a long time, they eventually came down you know, with a diagnosis of uh, schizophrenia. So current research is showing that those genes that make them uh, smoke weed, the same genes that also made them come down you know, with psychosis. So, these are brain circuits that we say actually subserve this kind of function. So you see that is the 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 substance, the substance that is actually interfering with the brain function, or it's even uh, other things or genetic problems that can make it illegal come down with it. And sometimes it's like the substance use is like the key that switches on, you know, the mental disorder. Since it's the same substrate. You know that is responsible for both. So estimated, it's also estimated that half of vulnerability to addiction is attributable to genetics, and that's very true. And that's why you find that people who are uh, who start substance use very early, if you're able to take a very good history, and then also do a thorough assessment, discover that it may even run in families. In my place here, since alcohol is a major problem, as Beatrice said, you know she also has similar problem in Kenya. You find that it runs in families. And when you take the history, you are teaching students and you take history and you talk to them. By the time you take the history, they get to a point and they start looking at you because you are only trying to drive them to see how these things are linked. And then they now begin to believe. Because so, in, in my place, some lecturer was saying that genes do not contribute to uh, uh, substance use. And then they try to discourage the students from uh, believing or having the idea that genes contribute. That it's just a, you know, a social. Uh, phenomenon is it comes about through social learning 
And uh, it was a very terrible thing. I said, well, they have no evidence. We are talking about evidence-based you know, uh, 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 treatment. And there's a lot of evidence out there to show that genes, you know, are contribute to or predisposed to developing substance use. And have, have the vulnerability is up to 50% when you talk about genes. And we see it, those of us who are in clinical practice, always. So the genes also interact to create vulnerabilities to substance use and mental disorder directly, truly. A protein influence a positive response to a drug. Somebody tests alcohol and says, oh, I enjoy it. But somebody tests it and says, no, I don't enjoy alcohol because it gives me headache. And I don't, I don't sleep well, so I don't take it. And when I take just a glass, then I go haywire. I'm, I'm screaming, I'm disturbing you know, everybody around, and I don't like it. But somebody tells that enjoys it, and we say in my play, they say, he drinks like fish. He's never tired of drinking. It's the same thing. Somebody tests cocaine and says, oh, I enjoy it. And he'll continue until he's exhausted. But somebody will say, I take cocaine. It's too much. It drives me, doctor. It drives me too crazy. I, I lose control. So I have to you know, use heroin to, to actually taper down because I can't cope with it. So this is, the difference is explained by genetics. And how long a drug remains in the body? We're talking about metabolism now. Depends on the, the individual genetic predisposition. Some people are able to metabolize some drugs faster, some don't metabolize it faster, and it becomes a problem to them. And we know we see that, especially for those who are defective in some genes that are you know, responsible for uh, uh, metabolizing uh, alcohol, and then they don't have enough enzymes, and then uh, the, the metabolize, you know, accumulate, and it becomes a problem to them. So, genes definitely contribute. Research has shown. So we shouldn't just, you know, talk, you know, as uh, people who have no knowledge. We are talking about evidence-based uh, uh, knowledge now, treatment. And then create vulnerabilities indirectly, altering how an individual responds to stress and increasing likelihood of risk-taking behaviors. Genes interact with among themselves. They also interact with environment. And you find that uh, some people are not able to respond to stress well. And we, when we are talking about the definition of health, you know, mental health, we say somebody who is able to cope with the daily stress of life. Or some people are not able to cope. So the genes that help them to actually cope with stress might be defective. And then the individual is not able to cope with stress, then comes down with mental illness, or he goes using substances. And then they also increase the likelihood of risk-taking behaviors. That is very correct. Some people are just not... Uh, Composed, they never come. They are restless. And for some, their development is somehow delayed. And we say ADHD uh, uh, clients, if they are not treated, will not be able to pay attention. So when they don't pay attention, they don't learn. They don't learn much. So they are prone to all kinds of risky lifestyle. And they take substances, they come down with mental illnesses. So it's the genes that are actually uh, involved and they explain all these var uh, variabilities which I will see. So Genes play a major role in addiction or mental illness, and we need to know that and don't uh, confuse people about the role of genes, you know, in uh, concession of either mental illness or substance use. Brain impact. The brain cycles using the neurotransmitter dopamine are affected by addictive substances and may be involved with depression, schizophrenia, or other psychiatric disorder. Yes. The same brain cycles, you know, are involved in all this. Major disorder. We see, you know, we see that later when we take individual uh, disorders and then we, we treat them. So, you for and because of individual you know, vulnerability and different genetic makeup, you find the same stress or the same problem. Somebody is coming down, and I see them in families, or I see them even in 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 twins. Uh, I see them in monozygotic twins. They the same lifestyle, everything, but one is coming down with depression, the other is coming with schizophrenia. And I've seen, in fact, I've gotten, I've seen a set of triplets who come, who came down one with mental illness, the other one with substance disorder, the other one with, you know, uh, 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 personality problems, with not the as this one mental disorder. So a set of triplets, and all of them coming down with one thing or the other. So it, this is a genetic vulnerability. You have your own genetic makeup, but yeah, this also interacts with the environment, and you have your own unique, you know, interaction, and this can cause a lot of changes in which the genes interact among the cells and with the environment. And then some people come down with one thing, the other person comes down with, you know, with a different thing. That is how this, you know, help us to explain the variability we see in the presentation. 
of various clients. Friends accusing the same neurotransmitter dopamine are affected by drugs. Antidepressants and antipsychotic medications directly target the regulation of dopamine, and that's very true. And dopamine pathways impact the ways in which stress increases vulnerability to drug addiction. We've said it, and stress is an environmental risk factor for both substance use and mental disorder, which shows that there's a same neurobiological you know, substance or circuit that you know subserves all these functions or leads to different expressions of uh, the disorders that we'll find. And you should also know that when there's a problem with one neurotransmitter, the body the body maintains an equilibrium, and there are several neurotransmitters in the brain. There's an equilibrium that the, that the brain tries you know, to uh, maintain. So when you interfere with dopamine, it doesn't mean that other neurotransmitters are just remain static. No, it's a dynamic system. So when you tamper with it at one end, you find a repercussion you know, in, a, in, a, in another end. And these neurons are also very much connected. So it's just a simplified way of saying where we are talking of this circuit, we are talking of the other, you know, a different circuit. But there's a lot of connections, you know, in you know, the process. So we should uh, be aware of that. That there's a lot of interaction amongst our uh, neurotransmitters, and then the stress to stress interferes uh, or uh, leads people to uh, mental illness because it affects the way. Uh, the body, you know, regulates stress, and then you begin to find some the derangement in the neurotransmitter in the in the brain, and then the person comes down to mental illness, depending on his vulnerability. In fact, some come down with just physical illness, but some come down with mental uh, illness. So, additional brain effects: there are overlap of brain areas involved with substance use disorders and mental disorders, and this suggests changes caused by one affect the other. I tried to explain that earlier. So social abuse that persists symptoms of mental illness may produce changes in brain structure and function that trigger an underlying tendency to develop that mental disorder. So, so the substance abuse, you know, uh, may affect the, the, the neurotransmitters and the receptors in such a way that it only triggers off, you know, the development of a mental disorder. And that's why even when the individual stops using the substance, maybe even after one or two years, after using the substance, the mental illness you know, still continues because it's the same you know, biological uh, uh, cycle that's involved. So we have to you know, know that very well and know that this is interact. And the essence is that when you see one, please look for the other. Mental disorders may change brain activity, no doubt, by enhancing their positive effects and also reducing awareness of their negative effects. And most times, we, they just enjoy the high or the pleasure they get you know, for the substances. But the awareness of the negative effects is not just there because the prefrontal cortex, the brain is not yet uh, uh, fully developed. They have interrupted the uh, brain development and then they they they've over exercised the the the, the uh, pleasure pathway, and then they're enjoying the, that's the reward uh, uh, circuit. It's very active, so they enjoy everything, but they don't think of the consequences. They're not really aware of the negative effect. And most times, when you engage them, honestly, they tell you, "I never sat down to think about this. This is the first time I'm doing this. I, I didn't see it that way." So, elevating the unpleasant effects as well with the mental disorder. Or the medication used, you know, to treat it. So, mental disorders may change brain activity, and we know we said that when people become addicted to uh, substances, the brain adapts either at the receptor level or by reducing the, the release of the neurotransmitters. So, this brain adaptation causes other changes in the brain. So, it's, it's a dynamic system. It, the brain doesn't remain static because one neurotransmitter, if the if uh, dopamine is not re released or the receptors are not responding, it doesn't mean that the other neurotransmitters are just watching and then standing aloof and you know and watching what's going to happen. No, that's a dynamic interaction. So many things can happen. So we are now going to small group exercises. We have uh, resource pages that uh, we are supposed you know. To be assigned to different groups and then you read them and let us discuss 
uh, I, I know we don't have time, but I'm going to give them, you know, as assignment. We have, uh, like, uh, you read them and then you discuss them in the email. Read your assigned resource page and then uh, discuss them in, in, in your groups and then uh, maybe you can re report them uh, on the email. Let me, let us go to the uh, resource pages. So there's a resource page, 1.1, 1 .1, the Diagnostic and Physical Manual of Mental Disorders, criteria for social disorder. Uh, I want to uh, we'll read them and then we have uh, 1.2, classification of mental and behavioral disorder. And uh, yes, so uh, I want to. Uh, um, I Marcus, want those from Northern. Yes, please. Um, we uh, need to wrap up as quickly as possible so Kim could speak. Yes, I'm, I'm just giving it to do it as a as Okay, assignment. just making sure. <laughs> Yes. So 1.1, 1 .1, those from Northern Africa and South Africa can read it and then discuss it with us on the email. And then 1.2, uh, East and uh, West Africa can read and then discuss it in the email. So thank you for your participation. That's the end for me. Hey, everyone. Um... Thanks, Moses. Uh, so I want to show, I know a lot of people have had, um, well, maybe not a lot. Some of you have tried to get on the learning management system and had a hard time. And so I want to um, go, I wanted to walk through it so you could see that. And um, maybe we could actually even do the, um, the discussion, the homework from the um, assignment that Moses gave in the learning management system. So I'm gonna share my screen. Okay, let's see. Okay. So hopefully you are seeing the, uh, the page that I sent you about how to log into Healthy Knowledge. Is that correct? Um, we can see your screen, yes. Um, so there's this link that you have to click on. Now it worked when I was practicing. Hmm. We'll take you, can you see the healthy knowledge page now? Um, we're still seeing the Word document right now. All right, let me. Oh, just... now we aren't seeing anything. Yeah, let me share that. Okay, when you click on that link and it works, it will take you to this page. Um, and then you have to find, there's a lot of stuff here and I found that, so where you click is this little button where it says UTC walkthrough. Um, so if you click on that, it will take you to a page that, well, well you'll, actually I'm already signed in. So what we'll do is take you to a page that you have to log, like you have to create a user um, instance in this healthy knowledge thing, unless you've already got one. So you'll have to go through a process of signing up and then it will get you to this page. Um, and if it doesn't, the other thing that you'll bring you to some kind of a home page, and you can go to my courses up here and that will get you to this page. And so we're, there's two things I wanna show. We're on course three. So course one and course two, don't ignore, I, I just created this as a template with everything in it, but we're in course three. So you, now see, you're probably seeing my view. So if you go into this, let me make it so I can't see this. If you go into this, you're gonna have a different view. Let me just make it so that I look like a student. So let me go back to course three. So you get this message that says these, nothing is available 
unless you complete the pretest. So you have to click on the pretest and answer the questions. And they'll all come up and you have to answer them. And once you answer them, and it doesn't matter what your answers are, once you answer all of them, you hit submit questionnaire and it will take you back and everything should be unlocked so that you can access them. And I'm gonna go back into my own view. And then everything will be available. So the manual, the um, right now, all that's available is the, um, is the uh, participant manual, but all the slides are in there. And then the links to all of the, um, all of the Zoom meetings will be in each of these lessons. And once we have the video, I'll post the video in the lesson as well. And so that's what lives in here. And we could, we could use the discussion. So let me, let me return to my own role. So we could use the discussion forum. You click on discussion forum. Um, we can put the homework assignments here. So um, Moses, if you like, I could add the, the question here, the homework assignment here and put it here and start a discussion. And then people can just type their responses in there um, once you've logged in. And that's really it. But that's really it. So, um, are, can we have a few questions in the chat? It says, it, says um, it wasn't unlocked after it they wasn't answered. After they answered. Hmm. The pretest. The pretest. I'm gonna have to look. I'm gonna have to look. It was for. People. Some people I can some people I I'm sorry, I muted a bunch of you so that I could lose my echo. Um just what are the other questions? So I'll go in and look, but send me an email if you if the content wasn't unlocked and I'll go see if I can figure out for that those individuals what the problem was. Okay. Um do you need me to read their names or can you see the chat? Oh, no, I know I'm out, so I should be able to see the chat again. Okay. Um, people's time. Okay. Um, yeah, some people have, some, I know some people have gotten in and gotten the material, so I'm not sure what happened when you didn't unlock, when, you, when it didn't unlock. Um, let me just, I'll have to look at that. So I will figure it out and I will send you an email. So are there other questions? I would say, so, so, it, so if you have difficulty, um, send me an email and I will try to figure out what the problem is. And if I can't figure out um, yes, here you go. That you, you click on the done button, and so, so it should just be automatic. But if it's not automatically working, then I probably set something up wrong. And if you click on the done button, um, let me just share. Um, yeah, and if you can't download something because the, the file size is too big, let me know that. Um, and we'll figure out another way to get it for you. The, the, um, the manuals are pretty big size files. Are there other questions? I know it's past time. So if there are issues, let me know um, and I will try to resolve them over the weekend. And if I can't resolve them in the learning management system, I will get you the manual in another way and I'll work with the help desk um, with, for the, from the people with healthy knowledge. Um, but everyone, everyone should 
be able to use those instructions and get in. And so anything to say about tomorrow? Tomorrow we're on again tomorrow evening and um, I won't see you then. I was gonna say I'll see you then, but I guess Beatrice, Moses, and Jessica will all see you then. Good night, everybody. Bye, everyone.